Welcome back to Out Loud, the Selective Mutism podcast. I'm Chelsea. And I'm Ann, Chelsea's mom. And today we have a special guest from the thehighlysensitivechild.com. Um, her name is Maureen. Welcome, Maureen. Um, Maureen is a mom of two boys um, and I guess worked in the corporate world for a number of years um, before your current position, which I believe is a coach, a writer, a blogger, an educator on sensitive children. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything did I leave anything out that's um a list that's pretty much it you cut out for a second but I think you you pretty much have yeah. did okay. you get it I, uh, yeah I think you got it all <laughs> and one of your sons had selective mutism correct yes he did my oldest son is now 10 yeah so I guess just how did you discover selective mutism or like what's your story there Sure. So with my oldest son, um, when he was very young, we started just noticing certain things were just a little bit different about him than other children, probably right around like the toddler preschool age. He was like very, he was, he was a very observant kid, very like used a lot of big words actually, like when he was home with us and it was funny because when people started coming over the house, when he was about a toddler or preschooler, he would come and stop being wild and crazy and just sit on my lap and just sit there like a statue. And I thought at the time, I was like, oh, this is kind of nice change from the crazy toddler who was running around, like jumping all over the couches. And um, so I, we didn't think much of it at first. We kind of thought he might just be introverted. Like my husband and I were pretty introverted people. And then when we started a little mom's group and we, it was kind of like a school preschool type thing. And that's where I first noticed that he was interacting with the kids a lot differently than the other kids interacted with each other. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to play with them. He wanted to do his own thing. He, um, he wouldn't sit in circle time. He had trouble at gym, just a lot of red flags started coming up. And so I thought, oh, maybe he just needs to be with kids more often. <laughs> so, cause he was home with me and um, when I worked, he was with my mom. So he wasn't really around a lot of kids. So I enrolled him in a little two and a half year old preschool program at a church nearby. And he seemed to like it. Like he would go, he didn't really have too much trouble separating. He came home happy, but about a month in, we had our first evaluation and she she had this little report card and was going over the things he could and couldn't do. And she got to this whole section on communication. And she said, I, I can't evaluate his speech because I've never heard him talk before. Mm-hmm. And that was such a shock to me because he talked nonstop. His vocabulary was amazing. Mm-hmm. And it just didn't, I didn't even know that was something that could happen. And she asked me, have I ever heard of the term selective mutism? And, and thank God she did, because that's how it all got on my radar. And um, kind of to make a long story short, it did take some time to find the right provider for us who truly understood it. And then I ended up at the Smart Center with Dr. E, who I, you've had on your show, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was great. So a long story short, that's pretty much how we, we got in touch with her and started treatment. At the age, he was three when we started treatment. So that's actually pretty amazing that, I mean, you were, he was diagnosed actually really early, actually. Yes. Um, It was picked up, you know, and I'm shocked that they actually knew the terminology, selective Mm -hmm. mutism, because that's kind of rare that people actually know. Yeah, Hmm. absolutely. The teacher, she had actually taught someone else and it was such a small little church preschool that they actually had someone a few years earlier Uh, And a mom put it on her radar. And that's the only reason, I mean, it probably would have taken a lot longer if I hadn't heard that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So you kind of, you started blogging about selective mutism? I did. So at at first it was not a, like, it was a personal blog, just, just on my own. I just needed to get it out because like life was, it was such, so crazy. I just felt like I, life was crazy at the time. And I just wanted to write down everything we've been doing for myself and just to see if there are patterns. And then I joined a couple Facebook groups uh, for parents of select mutism. And I started like kind of reluctantly sharing my blog a little bit with people. And it kind of started getting a lot of traffic. 
And um, so then I realized, oh, wow, there's so many people who could benefit from learning about mm -hmm. selective mutism. And then there was this whole other component, which is the high, highly sensitive part that people seemed really drawn to wanting to know more about. Yeah. Yes. And that was, um, you know, in speaking, when we had Dr. E on the show, that was one of the main things. It was just, she has such a wealth of information. It was like mind boggling by the end of the interview. <laughs> What happened? It I was have to re-listen to it. We were there. Yeah. Yeah. But it yes. brought, for me, it brought back so much because Chelsea's now grown. Um, but I think a lot of times with selective mutism, we get so caught up in the speech aspect mm -hmm. and that we forget it really affects everything. Um, and that whole topic of sensitive child or being, you know, sens sensory integration issues and all that is such a huge piece of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Want to tell the listeners what high sensitivity is? <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. So high sensitivity, it's, it's a genetic trait. It's not a disorder. I think a lot of people get that mixed up. Like they, can, they think it's something you can treat. Right. Um, so high, a highly sensitive person or an HSP or an HSC, as I call a highly sensitive child, is just someone who they feel things a lot more deeply they tend to notice a lot more in their environment. Like they really pick up subtleties in their environment. Um, they're very observant. Like I remember my son was always being told, oh my gosh, he's so observant. Like he seemed really like just taking in the whole situation. Um, they're very in tune with people's emotions and they like they feel their emotions. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing that, they they also um, have very strong emotional reactions. Um, and they're very over, they get very easily overstimulated by sensory input, like bright lights and mm -hmm. loud noises and smells and crowds. Mm -hmm. um, they also, uh, they need a lot of downtime. Um, and Dr. Dr. Elaine Aaron, have you heard of her? She's kind of like the pioneer of mm -hmm. high sensitivity. Right. She's got the book out, right? Yeah. She's got a, a couple books and she kind of characterizes is as um, like an acronym called DOES, D-O-E-S. So it's high sensitive person is depth of processing, overstimulation. Um, they have a lot of empathy and emotional reactivity. So they have, hmm. they really react to things. Um, hmm. And then the subtleties is the S in their um, environment. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and uh, about 15 to 20% of the population is highly sensitive, which it's not enough for people to really, un like, really have a lot of knowledge about. Mm -hmm. right. so a lot of people still don't understand high sensitivity unless you, I mean, I didn't until I had my son and we came across the book and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, yeah. this is us. Um, but it's, it's not a flaw. It's not a weakness. It's not a disorder. Um, it's just a trait that right. a lot of people have. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I haven't really heard of it until maybe a year ago. And I feel yeah. like, I don't know what you think, but I think I fit it pretty. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we dealt with all of that when I Chelsea was that. little. So I don't know. I always mm. thought of all that as part of selective mutism. I'm just wondering how you separate it from sensory processing disorder and selective mutism. And I don't yeah, know. I think uh, it's a tough one. The, the sensory processing versus the highly sensitive child. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, um, so for like, first I'll do selective mutism and then I'll do like the sensory if that's okay. Okay. Um, so Dr. E, I remember her telling me like a common trait in, children who have selective mutism is that heightened sensitivity to things in their environment and a depth of processing. Like they really process things deeply. They think about them, but not every child who is highly sensitive has selective mutism and not every child who has selective mutism is highly sensitive, but it's just one of those things that um, is, is fairly common. Mm -hmm. And then as far as sensory processing, it's a little trickier because it's a little bit of a blurred line. Um, so sensory processing disorder, and I mean, I'm not a doctor, but this is how I understand it. It's a neurological condition and a child can either be under responsive to sensory stimuli where like they seek sensory input or they can be over responsive to sensory stimuli where they 
you're like they avoid it or they're um they're defensive like sensory defensive and that's that's the that's the place where sensory processing disorder and high sensitivity kind of overlap is that overstimulation area Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the um with with highly sensitive people they can be easily overwhelmed but um it's it's more situational like their their sensory signals aren't disorganized but um they're just heightened depending on the environment that makes sense sense. Mm -hmm. so um they may act out when like a trigger is present but when it's absent from their environment they can carry on normally where Mm -hmm. with a sensor with with people who are diagnosed with sensory processing disorder um the root cause isn't isn't um the same and the, the, the response is consistent no matter what environment they're, they're yeah. in. And with sensory processing, you have more or disorder, they, you have more of a problem functioning in life. Um, and that's where you need the occupational therapist to kind of help you through that. Right. Mm-hmm. So, and that's a real rough comparison, but that's kind of how yeah. I understand it. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And my son did see, we did go to an occupational therapist because I think he had high sensitivity plus like was definitely in, interfering with his life. So we did go and see an OT for, um, to work through some of that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. He had like, I mean, we had trouble with everything. And I, I remember listening to one of your guys' podcasts where, um, the, the toilets, the hand dryers. Oh the, yeah. Yeah. We had haircuts, we had nail cutting, like it took three people to cut his nails, um, <laughs> swimming, like so much of his life was just limited because he had like, he didn't like anything on his hands, like it, it mm-hmm. couldn't be dirty, yeah. um, band-aids, like just, I could go on and on, but oh, yeah. basically <laughs> like, there was a lot going on. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I feel as a, um, I don't know, like as a mom, and you mentioned, you know, having get togethers or trying play dates, like mm-hmm. I, I did mention it in one of our episodes, but it can really be isolating because I think even with Chelsea, you start out trying to have all these mom play dates and all that, but sounds similar, but you know, yeah. each time we would get together, it was her and I off on our own because she was either arching her back or, you know, something was wrong and <laughs> it ended up just being her and I, and then you just kind of, um, I don't know whether we stopped getting invited or, you know, just, kinda, but it can be very isolating. Absolutely. It was, it was definitely a hard period of time because yeah, we just felt like we couldn't do that stuff because either it was just too hard to explain everything to people that you kind of know, but don't really know, like, how do you get into it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it was very hard. It's, I think it's, I always say to other parents who are raising kids with selective mutism, like try to reach out and find someone in your area or someone going through the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. When we, I think that's part of the reason why I started blogging and, and getting involved with those Facebook communities because I felt like those people understood. Right. Um, and and there's then, so many out there. It's weird. Like yeah, you don't yeah. realize that you feel like you're the only one. That's true. Yeah. The yes. more you speak out about it, the more you, you find other people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like the internet. <laughs> how, was <Right>? your, <laughs> how was your family, Maureen? Were they, um, I mean, it can be really difficult, you know, I think they try to be supportive, but did your family, you know, get it? Did they, I, yeah. It can yes. Be- we, we had, yeah, our family was super supportive. We were lucky in that way. Like my, my parents, um, we're very understanding. My mom, we found out she's also highly sensitive and it just like, she really understood him and they had a really great relationship. My, my in-laws, they live a little, um, we don't see them as much. And so, um, and they come from a big loud Italian family, my husband's side. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a little bit more challenging to explain, okay, like you can't, yeah. jump in and try to greet him the second we get in the door and give him food. Like it was always kind of, I mean, we had cousins and everything on that side. So it was much more difficult to right. go there. We had to avoid some family get togethers because it was just um, overwhelming yeah. too much. And I don't know how you were Chelsea with pictures as a kid, but my son, yeah. 
it was a nightmare. Yes. And they always wanted these big group pictures and it just, oh, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> so bad sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> I was just going to say it was funny because one time um, my husband's family came home, I think from Texas or whatever, and they wanted to get a family portrait and we were dreading it because you know there's so it just many never went well there's so many bad pictures of me as yeah. a kid and of course they had their daughter Chelsea's cousin was you know the perfectly behaved child and you know just happy. perfect to a T yeah. yep smiles and happy. she needs a smile well that <laughs> day when we went to get the family uh, portrait done Chelsea for some reason was just perfect wow <laughs> her cousin was having a bad day mm -hmm. oh <laughs> wow yeah. So well, whenever we look at the family portrait, that's kind of the joke. The family joke is that picture and how. Oh, it, that's so funny! It worked out for us. <laughs> so, you said, um, was it his your son's grandmother found out she's highly sensitive? Yeah. Or, so, or, I'm just wondering, how do you like verify that? Is there like some kind of test or something? Like you said, it's genetic. So I'm just curious if there's any like research. Yeah, so I, I base all my stuff off of Dr. Aaron, Elaine Aaron, who's written okay. those books, and she does have on her site, if you go to um, hsperson.com backslash, I think it's test, okay. and she has one for adults and one for children. It's kind of just like a, a questionnaire where you check mm -hmm. off certain boxes, and if you get a certain percentage, you're likely highly sensitive. Mm -hmm. It's not a yeah. sophisticated test, but it it gives you an, a basic idea. And as you're reading them, like I knew when, when I was reading the book, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is me. This is also my husband. And then I showed it to my mom and we, we all took the test and we're like, yep, yeah, this is us. <laughs> oh, interesting. Wow. Oh, there is a test. You can go to her site and, um, I have to take it. I already know the answer. I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah a lot of moms come to me and and they're they say like when they read my book they're like oh my gosh um I'm realizing that I'm highly sensitive after realizing it for my child I think that happens quite a lot mm. yeah. so what tips what do you recommend for parents if you do have a highly sensitive child I mean I know you know they always say you know transitions try to you know prepare kids for transitions but other than that I mean what 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 do you suggest I think, well, I think it starts with acceptance because it's, they're not going to change. This is who they are. So you really need to accept them for who they are and try your best to understand that. And it can be hard as a parent, especially if you're not highly sensitive to accept that their behavior, especially when they're young, because it's, it's challenging. It's not easy raising a highly sensitive child. Um, and I think... A, like a much more simpler, slower paced lifestyle works best for a child like this. So, you know, in today's world, like a lot of kids are doing sports and act, tons of activities and constantly programming. And I found that that does not work for most sensitive kids who need that downtime. Mm -hmm. They, they just, for us, I think we can only do like one big, big activity a day. Like no more. If we have one in the morning, we cannot do another one later in the day because it's just too much. Um, and I think that as far as friendships go, I know for a lot of highly sensitive kids, it's really hard to make friends within a group. So you want to do those one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that's how we've built my son's like best friend, like just one-on-one -on -one play dates. That's, that's how they make their connections. And, um, friendships, at least in our situation. Mm -hmm. And I think just that, that the validation of their feelings, like labeling their feelings, letting them know these feelings are okay, because I mean, it's not always easy and we're not always perfect at it, but you want to try to make sure that they're feeling that they can feel this way because they have a lot of big emotions. Yeah. Um, and, and a predictable schedule, like they, they like to know what to expect because that decreases any, um, uncertainty, which makes okay. them nervous. Like if we're going somewhere, we don't need to do it as much anymore because they've, he's learned how to adapt, but like headphones or bringing certain things to help with the sensory stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty preparing them ahead, ahead of time is, is key. I remember, I remember we rearranged my son's bedroom once without telling him and it was like the end of the world. Like we thought we were doing this great thing and it, it was like, he was not expecting it. It was not okay. <laughs> I always 
say that. I probably say that in almost every episode that I think it's important to tell kids with selective mutism, but maybe it's mm-hmm. the highly sensitive part that I need to know exactly mm-hmm. what's coming and like have it all listed out for me exactly what time and I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like I think it. that's like just decreases anxiety because you yeah. know you know what's coming and you can yeah. prepare yourself for it. Yeah. yeah. And as a parent, just take time for yourself. Like get you're gonna need someone to help you out I think because it's it's not easy like I said it's it's challenging raising a highly sensitive kid there's a lot of rewarding parts but it's also yeah I noticed on your blog it's very like positive and it's like this isn't something that we're trying to fix it's just like kind of how a person is so Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what are like the benefits of being highly sensitive yeah I they're I think there's such creative people. I think highly sensitive people, they, they feel things deeply, they observe things and they, they're just really creative people in general. I don't know if you feel that way about yourself, but (laughs) I think they're very creative. They are, I think they're great friends. Once they make a connection, they're usually a very loyal friend. They care a lot about their friendships. Um, they 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 can't easily be fooled because they're they're very uh, observant. They take a lot in, and I think that they're they're very smart. They can read people and their environment and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I, think, I feel like yeah. I don't know. I notice just being myself that <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know certain like emotions. Like if I'm really sad or if someone says something like to make sometimes it's not even trying to make fun of me, but if I perceive it as making fun of me, like, it's a total overreaction on on my part, like, the whole, my whole insides just, like, shut down, it's, like, that's the worst thing that could have, I don't know, Mm -hmm. it's, like, it feels like an emotional overreaction, which I think makes sense. Like, you're overthinking it, maybe, a little bit, like, or? Yeah, it's just, like, things affect me more than I feel like they should, and I'm like, mm-hmm. why does it bother me so much? But I think sometimes with selective mutism, too, you, you, you've you tried so hard to form the relationships that you have that sometimes it's, I don't know, I think you're, it's, you're like, you are at a heightened state or whatever, like, you've invested so much in the friendships that you have. But not even if a, a friend says something, like, it could be some random person. Oh, hmm. Like, things just affect me more than is normal, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you say, and they say you experience things more deeply. Like, so you when you're sad, you're more sad. But then when you're you're happy, you're usually highly sensitive people are, like, more happy, too. It goes both ways. So, yeah. Maureen, did you... um? Did you have a 504 or an IEP for your son? Or We did. Yes, we had an, not in preschool, at the church preschool, but eventually when, once we figured out selective mutism is what he had, where he went was just not equipped to like handle mm-hmm. the, the strategies we wanted to put in place with him. So we moved to our public school that actually had a preschool and that's where we implemented an IEP and there was like a child study team so it was just set up to help us yeah so we were really lucky with early diagnosis and a great school staff really helped us get to where we are now and would you say is your son cured now from that son or how's he doing definitely um he's yeah he's verbal in all areas he's he's been in the talent shows and I mean, he's still, he's never going to be like the life of the party, you know, like I'm not like that either. Uh, and he, he still gets nervous, but he can go up and speak in front of, uh, an audience. He has done that on a microphone at assemblies, um, where before he couldn't even do show and tell or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So he's come a really long way. And each year I feel like he's getting more secure in who he is. And, Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I would say we are, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's like cures the word, but I'd say he's pretty much, he's verbal in all situations. Like once in a while, there might be like something that sets him back just a little, but then he, he right. bounces right back from it. But yeah, yeah. I would say I it's hard to, to, there's not like a specific point in time where you can say someone is cured of SM. Like I don't, I can't even pick 
what year of my life that was like there's yeah. just the anxiety stays most yeah. I feel like most of the time so if you have social anxiety that's not just gonna go away but it doesn't mean you can't speak in all different settings true right yeah, yeah. exactly Maureen I was looking at your website about uh, tantrums and um sensory meltdowns mm -hmm. and I guess one thing that came to mind for me I mean Chelsea was always a rule follower but my, I know my boy who did not have SAM but um was very different than Chelsea so I got thinking like how di you know I'm thinking disciplining a highly sensitive child must be really hard really tough to not overdo it like yes what <laughs> what method did you use I mean <laughs> you know, any suggestions there so there's some things you should avoid and I'm going to say that I've done all these things because I'm human, but you should avoid yelling as best you can. I mean, cause they already, they already feel that stress. So the yelling does not help. Um, and isolating them, like putting them in a timeout far away, isn't usually the best idea for a highly sensitive child. Um, cause they're, it's not, like it, it's, it, it's a fine line with discipline. Um, you don't want to shame them because usually highly sensitive people, they already have enough guilt. Like they know when they did something wrong mm -hmm. and so they don't need it to be magnified because that mm -hmm. just makes things worse. So mm -hmm. I think that's something, um, you want to make sure that you connect with them afterwards. You're not withdrawing your love from them is an important thing. Um, we like to create we don't do it so much anymore because they're older, but like a calm down spot. Well, we still kind of do it. Like they, they go to their room and just have their quiet time. But like for younger kids, like having a, a spot where they can just go and calm down when they're just completely out of sorts. And, um, yeah, I think just being conscious of your, your tone of voice, your, like the volume you're using with them, um, and just be clear on what you expect. So they know what to expect as well. I think tone of voice is a big deal and body language because these kids pick up on what you're feeling. Like if someone else is really anxious and like amped up, then you just take it on immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like feelings are contagious. Yeah. Yes, it is. Like when I'm stressed, I, I, my son, I can see him feeling that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Definitely. sure. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. There's a lot like that I, I, I knew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people on the autism spectrum are highly sensitive. And I always used to say this to staff when I worked in like a group home. I was like, if you're acting angry and stressed, like these kids can feel it and they're going to um, show it in their behavior, mm. especially when they're nonverbal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's so an interesting connection right there. So you recognize these things yes. where other people, <laughs> it's just their job or whatever, but you're actually there recognizing it and being an advocate for those kids. Yeah, so that's absolutely right there. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. Yes. So I also saw you created like a, it's called my book of brave. So I was oh. wondering what that's all about. <laughs> Sure. So that kind of stems from something we did as like a therapy for my son when he was going through selective mutism, basically a way to recognize his feelings, um, talk about them so that he then had control over those feelings. So what we had was like a scary chart. And every time we would do any type of cognitive behavioral like game, I don't know how your treatment was, but we did lots of games where he had to play the waving game or the ordering game. So anytime we did an activity, at the end of the day, usually we'd, we'd sit down and we'd go over like, okay, remember when we did this, how did that make you feel? And there was like a not scary face that he could point to, a little scary, scary, and then very scary. And then once he pointed to that, we weren't supposed to make any judgment. It was just kind of like, okay, I see how you felt this way, you know, what can make it less scary next time? Or that's how we kind of started the conversation. Mm -hmm. And he was only three at the time. So we would just point to the faces. And then as he grew, I started making it into more of like a place where he could write and color in the face and kind of make it more for him. 
and then um, it worked so well for us. And bedtime was when he really liked to talk to us about everything that went on during the day. So that's when we did it. And then I kind of just made it into a journal and um, yeah, started started um, sharing with other parents who really liked it. And then I started selling it on Amazon. <laughs> that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. You. I yeah. love that. Yeah. That's very so, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even they still, they still use it sometimes. So they don't use it as much anymore. Like my older son, but he, it was funny the other day, he's like, where's my scary journal? I want to look back through it. And, we, and then we can look back and see how far he's come. So that's it's kind right. of a neat thing too. That is really cool. That's pretty neat. Yeah. yeah. So find that on your website. I, yeah, I'm going to put that in the show notes. And Amazon. Sure. It's on Amazon. That's cool. Yeah, it's on Amazon. And I'm actually, um, I, through my blog, actually, uh, I, I had written and I, you probably, this probably isn't on my blog yet, but, um, kids have so much trouble with like birthday parties and stuff like that. That was a huge thing. And I had written, um, like I've always been a writer, but I had written a story, a children's book story about that. And it got picked up by a, a publisher. So there, um, a book's going to be coming out for highly sensitive kids mm-hmm. on like, um, uh, like this child who really like it, it was titled the boy who didn't like birthday parties, but now that's changed. It's still in the process, but that's going to be coming out next fall. That's um, awesome. You. Congratulations. So, I'm excited you- to have a book for kids. They, they need books like that. More books like that. So I want to yeah. do that too. Well, yeah. yeah. I've always been saying I'm going to write a book. Yeah, yeah you should. Yeah. Were very <laughs> stressful. Even family parties were stressful. Mm. Oh my gosh. Parties were very tough. We had to avoid them for a while for kids. I mean, the kids' birthday parties, you get the, the music and the, ba- I don't know the bounce houses were, everyone had a bounce house party. <laughs> yeah. They just did not work for us. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on there. Yeah. What yeah. do you feel like, I always wonder, like, what were the big things that, like, helped your son with selective mutism? Like, what would you say to families who are struggling right now? The biggest things um kind of like turning points or what was most helpful getting the school on board was the absolute most helpful thing because um that was the last place he became verbal so we started with I'd say one-on-one play dates were really big because Mm -hmm. that started helping him we be able to find his voice with different kids and grow his confidence Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest things. And that's not easy to do. I mean, that that's a lot of work on the parents part, but if you can get, we, we even got like, um, set up, like before he went to this new school, we were able to talk with the school and find a couple kids that were going to be in his class. And we did one-on-one play dates. And one of them is still like his best friend to this day. Mm-hmm. I think that helped with that transition into school. Um, and then really for us, it was getting the school on board and getting, them to implement what it, we needed them to implement. That was huge because once he overcame school, it was kind of like just went off, hit the ground running from there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's more. I feel like it's, yeah. I feel like it was years ago, even though it wasn't that long ago, but I think they were two of the biggest things. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely think that's like a, a big obstacle that some people have when schools aren't willing to work. Um, yes. yes. Or just the lack of understanding. Um, you so really have to be an advocate for your child, like so much. Like mm-hmm. we had a, yeah, we had to fight for him a, a lot. Yeah. And it does, it depends on your school for sure, which. Yeah. Um, so you also have the Facebook group, which people can go join if they feel like their kid is highly sensitive or maybe they're highly sensitive. Um, I yeah. think it's a good group, like of people I've, I actually joined the group. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and the people seem like really supportive and it's like a helpful community. So and yeah, what is it's a great called? group of um it's called Parents of Highly Sensitive Children. I think it's like um sorry of it. It's like Facebook. I mean, if you if you look at parents of highly sensitive children, it'll it'll pop up. We just yeah. hit like I think three thousand, three thousand people and they're yeah. they are. It's a great group of um parents and if you have a question you can ask and um, we usually, usually get like a bunch of responses. Yeah. Right. That's really cool. Part of. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that is your, <laughs> like, uh, I, you have so many resources and stuff on your website. Like it's, um, 
Yeah. Okay. What a great book. I mean, The Highly Sensitive Child is definitely a book I'd recommend yeah. um, with the high sensitivity. And then she just came out with a book recently called The Highly Sensitive Parent. And it's all about being a parent who's highly sensitive raising oh, okay. highly kids. So that's, I mean, for parents who may be listening, that's, that was a great book to read because a lot of times it's focused on the child, but this is also yeah. helping a parent who it may also be going through all that stuff and trying to raise a child like that. Um, and there's also a really good uh, documentary about high sensitivity done by Dr. Aaron. Cause a lot of times people want to share stuff with their family, but they don't want to just give them a book. So there's a good yeah. documentary about oh, it. I'll have yeah. to watch that. Do you know what it's called or I can just look it up, I guess. If it's I think it's sensitive. The movie.com is the site. Okay. Huh. Yeah. That's good to know. Cool. It's a good resource. Yeah. I also saw you have a back to school workshop that is free. I well, I did. I <laughs> oh, <it's> over. <laughs> oh, no. I meant to tell you about that before we started. So <laughs> I, I'm not running that right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Is that because of like the whole COVID situation? Yeah, well, I have a course that for parents that like a, a um making sense of sensitivity at school, which is okay. a whole course, and that was like a workshop that gave them some tips and then talked about how to sign up for the course. So I still have the course, but yeah, right now I'm, I'm, it's, I'm not really promoting it because okay. things are so different in the world. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so still a lot of variation. Yeah. I don't know. Are there's you, homeschooling yeah. and remote learning. And are your kids going back, Maureen? They are. Um, they go back next week. So we have a really small school district and they're going back half days. Um, mm. Cause homeschooling, that was another thing. I mean, uh, that did not go well as like a highly sensitive parent homeschooling highly sensitive kids who have big reactions. It just <laughs> did not go that well. Um, it was hard. And Zoom meetings, I, I wrote a post on this recently where a lot of kids, selective mutism and high sensitivity really struggle with the whole Zoom yeah. meeting, mm -hmm. learning type thing. Like just having their face on camera all the time and the, all the people talking and all the different faces popping up. It's just, it was a challenge for sure. So yeah, we're going to, well, we're, they start next week. We're going to see how that goes. Yeah. So we'll say, I don't they're know how they're wearing masks. Last. They're wearing masks. Yes. How and do they do with that? Are they? They're, <laughs> yeah, I was listening to your, your um, podcast on the mask thing and you gave some great tips. I, and I'm, I'm using some of them. Um, oh. And I think that um, they're, they're really good with masks because we found a mask that they like that mm -hmm. hangs around their neck. It's loose. Yeah. Um, how they've never worn them for four and a half hours, I guess. So that we'll see how that goes. Enough. Yeah. Should That's a lot to ask of anyone, I feel like. It is. I know some schools are having mask break areas, but I don't really know how that works. I think it depends. I'm sure each school is different, but. Yeah, I think ours, I think they do get a, like a little recess outside where they can put down their masks, mm -hmm. um, maybe like 20 minutes or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it'll be, I, I feel for the teachers. Yeah. It'll be an interesting year for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, are your boys excited to go back or were they enjoying the break? Well, they were so excited to be homeschooled and like be home because they're, they're homebodies. Like they love being home, but honestly, like we've gotten to a point where they, they're actually really excited to go back, which is a good thing, but because <laughs> usually they're not at the end of summer. They're like, no, we just want to stay home more, but they are ready. Yeah. Good. They're ready. Yeah. I think it'll be a, uh, I think they'll get sick of it quickly probably because they love being home, but I, I think they just need something different. And they, I think they miss that socialization with some of their friends and just having those activities and being in school. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be good for them. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. So the name of the blog is the highly sensitive child.com. Mm -hmm. yes. Is that where they find it? Yes. 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 Um, you also have an Instagram and a Twitter. Are they all the highly sensitive child? I think I follow you on all of them. The only thing I don't have is Instagram. I still okay. I, I feel like I'm so old I haven't figured that one out. But I know it's <laughs> really popular. But I'm, I have Pinterest, <laughs> Facebook, and uh, Twitter. Yes. Okay. <laughs> great. I could put everything in the notes too. Well, that's great. I think it was, um, I mean, it definitely, you know, it sort of intertwined with selective mutism and, um, 
Yeah, what a great, I don't know, because I know we have trouble kind of teasing it out. Yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't have selective mutism anymore, but what is all this, like, extra stuff that I've had Mm -hmm. forever? But it's all, it's like a mix of anxiety and, like, some sensory issues and feeling a lot. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. that sounds like never on its own. It's it's the combination of things that creates that. Yeah. Yeah. I was interested to find out about high sensitivity. I was like, wow. Yeah. I've not heard of that before. Yeah, you sh- I definitely read it book <laughs> to you. <laughs> yeah, so I'll have to read more about it because I think it applies to me. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was great. I, I love talking about that and just helping other parents understand it better because it is. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, what is, the, what is your book called again? What's the book called? My, my Book of Brave. So that's yeah. available on your website then? You can access or it. Amazon. It's just going to link you to Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in My Book of Brave, you, the journal will pop up. Yep. That sounds like a great tool. It's kind of we used to do it, but not like a formal thing. Yeah. Kind of. So that sounds great. Yeah. And then, um, and when did you say your other book is coming out? Next fall, so fall 2021, um, and the pub, I'm not allowed to like, there's, they, they're not letting me give out any details yet, but um, when I do, I'll be sure to share it with you yeah. when more info comes fun. out. <laughs> yeah, let us know. That's yeah. great. We can definitely share it. I think okay. a lot of people would like it. Yeah. yeah, I think it'd be good for a lot of kids, even like, even if they're not SM or high, or high sensitivity, it's like more just anxiety and yeah. dealing with all the stimulation that comes with a birthday party yeah so. yeah well it was great um great having you on I just Chelsea and I you know I guess it's we kind of started after we've been through it all and then you started while you're going through it yeah um, but it's just great just you know helping educate help spread the word make people aware um but hopefully people would be more understanding yeah um, definitely I think you're doing a great thing with the SM podcast that's that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea. I'm going to listen to you guys more now that I know that you have <laughs> one. Yeah, I don't think there's meant. Are there any others? That's what we're, when we were trying to name the podcast and we were looking up for the name of it. And when we actually found out, oh my gosh, there's not one other podcast that's dedicated right. to selective mutism. There's episodes about it, but there's no podcast that only does selective mutism. So yeah. we, couldn't, we couldn't believe it. So we're like, okay, we're definitely doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's in your right. future. Maybe there's a podcast in your future. <laughs> there you go. Maybe. a <laughs> <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Maureen. This has been great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Been thank great. you so much for having me. It's, it's mm-hmm. been, it's been, I was excited for this. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Maureen. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, bye, guys. Bye. Bye. bye, bye. Hi guys, it's Chelsea. I have an exciting announcement. I just wanted to pop on and let you guys know. We now have a website. Go check out outloudsm.com where you'll find all of our episodes and more information about selective mutism. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.